Okay, Lenz's law. Lenz's law is intimately related to Faraday's law. We've got two concepts in this section. And um, we'll start off with a demonstration. We're going to use this Thompson coil to demonstrate several principles that we've been talking about. The first is, if you take this solenoid, this is a coil of wire, cylindrical coil of wire. I'm not sure how many windings are on there. And we apply a current to it, then we can create a magnetic field in the center of the solenoid. Uh, we'll be energizing this with an uh, alternating current. 60 times a second, the direction of the current will change from clockwise to counterclockwise. And the magnetic field generated inside of the coil will be either up when we have clockwise current or down when we have a counterclockwise current. These rods here confine the magnetic field so that the magnetic field will extend beyond this uh, inductor and so that we'll be able to put uh, a ring on here to, to experience a um, change in magnetic flux. Now what's going to happen here is this, um, the world according to this, this ring, he's going to see a magnetic field that's up, then down, alternating 60 times a second. But that magnetic field will, through Faraday's law, that changing magnetic flux inside of this ring will generate an electromotive force, or EMF, inside that ring. There's a 90 degree phase lag between the change in flux and the EMF in the ring. Then that EMF in this ring will generate a current in the ring. There's a 90 degree phase lag between these two as well. So the bottom line is at the end of the day we get a current in this ring that's been created by this uh, changing magnetic flux through this um, through the ring. A current in a ring, if you think back to the third grade when you wound a wire around a nail and create and magnetize the nail, anytime you have a current in a ring, you create a magnetic field in the ring. But because of the phase lag, the two 90 degree phase lags um, that we talked about before, the direction of the field in this coil will be exactly opposite the direction of the field in the, uh, produced by the Thompson coil itself. So what happens then is that we have North Pole against North Pole and uh, a repulsive force on this ring, which allows you to levitate the ring. This is a steel ring. This is brass, a little bit better conductor and aluminum, an even better conductor. And finally, I got one more aluminum ring that I want to put on here and try out. Um, as you can see, this one fails utterly to, uh, to fly. The reason, we've got a slit in the ring that prevents any current in the ring and therefore prevents the, the magnetic force from pushing it up. That's Thompson coil. Lenz's law of electromagnetic in induction. The EMF induced by a changing magnetic flux drives an induced current and magnetic field that oppose the original change in flux. This is a mouthful. So this is the induced EMF, the EMF that's induced by a changing magnetic flux. Like we had changing magnetic flux through that coil in the Thompson coil, or through the ring in the Thompson coil experiment. 
drives an induced current and a magnetic field that oppose the original change in flux. So the, the key here is that the induced current and the magnetic field that's induced by that current oppose the change in the flux. They don't necessarily oppose the flux. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But they always oppose the change in the flux. And how do we translate that into actual problems? And you'll, we'll give you a lot, of, a lot of practice on this in the homework. So the trick here, there are four steps. State the direction of the applied flux. We'll do an example right after this. State whether this applied flux is increasing or decreasing with time. Number three, determine the direction of the induced flux. And if the applied flux is increasing, the induced flux is directed opposite. So the induced flux is increasing, I'm sorry, the apply, if the applied flux is increasing, then the induced flux is opposite to the applied flux. These are a lot of words right now. We'll do some examples. If the applied flux is decreasing, then the induced flux is in the same direction. And then use right hand rule two to determine the direction. So let me see if we can apply this uh, to a particular example. All right, permanent magnet. Here's my magnet, north pole here. And this is the direction of motion. So this is a velocity vector. It's approaching a loop of wire. So here's a loop of wire. And that, that magnet, imagine this marker being a magnet, it's moving in toward that loop of wire. Well, let's apply the steps. The first step in Lenz's law is to ask about the direction of the magnetic flux, of the applied magnetic flux through the wire. Well, first of all, we have to know what direction the magnetic fields are in. Well, we know about that. Magnetic fields come out of north poles and then back around into south poles. All right, so what's the direction of the magnetic, the applied magnetic flux through this coil? You'd say, well, the field is in that direction, and therefore the magnetic flux should also be in that direction. So this, this is key to step one, determining the direction of the applied magnetic flux. And we've just determined it. Step two is to ask whether this flux is increasing or decreasing with time. Well, is it increasing or decreasing? If the magnet's really far away from this loop, it's way up here, then the amount of its magnetic field that gets down to this loop is pretty small. But as we get closer and closer, we're seeing these magnetic field lines that are more and more concentrated. We're getting a stronger and stronger magnetic field. So that magnetic flux that's applied is down in this direction, and it's increasing. So the flyed flux is down, and it's increasing. That's step one and two, uh, increasing or decreasing. So let me just go back. The previous slide, is it increasing or decreasing with time? We've done both of those. Now, we're going to go and try and determine the direction of the induced flux. If the applied flux is increasing, the induced flux is directed opposite to the applied flux. Well, this applied flux is increasing. So that uh, 
phrase that I just read applies. If it's increasing, then the induced flux must be opposite. So step three says that the induced flux is opposite to the applied flux. All right, so that means that the induced flux is going to be in this direction. All right, then step four is to apply right hand rule number two. And um, that was the one where we placed our thumb in the direction of the magnetic field and our fingers curled in the direction of, of the current. So this is the direction of the induced magnetic flux and it's the same, the, the direction of the induced magnetic flux will always be in the same direction as the induced magnetic field. So if I now place my thumb in the direction of that induced magnetic field, my curling fingers will give the direction of the current. In induced in that coil. That's the way that works. The direction of the current. Let me just back up one direction of the induced current from the direction of the induced flux. And that's the way that works. I'll give you a lot of examples, but those steps, these steps are pretty bomb proof. If you can get them down, get those steps in your head and apply them each time when you're trying to do Lenz's law problems, you will succeed. All right, let's take a look at this one. Another example. The EMF produced by a moving copper ring. Uniform magnetic field is into the page in the shaded region. So here we have magnetic field that's into the page. Outside of that shaded region, there is no magnetic field. So you can imagine this maybe being uh, this ring falling through the region between two poles of a horseshoe magnet, for example, that would produce a region of magnetic fields. Well, we're supposed to find, uh, for each of the five positions, one, two, three, four, and five, we're supposed to determine whether an induced current exists, and if so, to find its direction. All right, what about position one? That ring, so just imagine taking your ring off and dropping it down in a vertical way. As it's approaching the magnetic field region, there is no magnetic field that penetrates this ring. Hence, no magnetic flux through the ring. I'm talking about as it's traveling uh, in this region here, before it enters into the magnetic field region. So up here, there's no flux. There's no applied flux. It's zero. And if there's no applied flux, then that flux can't possibly be changing. And therefore, um, no current. There are two other positions that, that have, um, well, there's one other position that's exactly the same as this one. Position five. After the ring has passed through the magnetic field region and is traveling down in the zero magnetic field area, there's no magnetic flux in it. There can't possibly be a current in it. So down here, there's also no current. There's a third position that's easy, and that's position three. Is there a magnetic flux through this ring? And you say, well, yeah, there is. At position three, 
the magnetic flux is going to be B A cosine of phi, but phi is the angle between the normal to this ring, the perpendicular to the ring, and the magnetic field, which would be zero. So in position three, we do have a magnetic flux. But at position three, what about at position three and a half, right here? How much flux does it have when it's right here instead of position three? You say, well, it's still in that uniform magnetic field region, and so the, the flux is still going to be the same. The area hasn't changed, and the magnetic field hasn't changed. So at position three and a half, <laughs> the flux is still the same. Well, Faraday's law says that there's only a current if the magnetic field, if the flux is changing. Remember, uh, the EMF is minus N times the change in flux divided by the change in time. Between position three and position three and a half, how much has the flux changed? What's the final minus the initial? Well, the final is equal to the initial. They're both the same. And therefore, the change in flux is zero. The EMF must be zero, and the current must also be zero. So at this position three, there's also no current. It's a little bit different than position one. Here, we had no flux, no applied flux. Here, we do have an applied flux, but the flux isn't changing. Okay, that's position three. So we got no current here, we got no current here, we got no current here. All right, what about the two remaining positions? Position two and position four. All right, let's, let's do position two. And we're going to uh, just work it through. At position two, it's actually part of the ring is in the magnetic field region, and part of the ring is out of the magnetic field region. But the amount of overlap of the ring with the magnetic field region is increasing. So at this position two, the applied flux, what's its direction? What's the direction of the magnetic field or the magnetic flux through that ring? You say, well, isn't the magnetic field into the board? And so isn't that the direction of the magnetic field through it? And I say, yes, you're right. This is in. So the pl applied magnetic flux is into this screen. Is it increasing or decreasing? You say, well, it's going to be the magnetic field times the area of overlap. So at this point here, that'll be the area of overlap. A little bit later point, it'll have more overlap area. So the magnetic field is going to stay the same, but the area, this guy here, is going to increase with time. So is this applied magnetic flux increasing or decreasing through that wire loop as it passes into the field? You say increasing, and I say you're right. It's in and it's increasing. Well, this is the case of <coughs> magnetic field being in, magnetic flux being in, and it's increasing with time. That goes back to exactly the same. <coughs> this one here, if the applied flux is increasing, the induced flux is directed opposite to the applied flux. So that will be 
The applied flux is in, it's increasing, therefore the induced flux is opposite. Well, what's the direction of what's the direction that's opposite in? And you say, well, it's out. Okay, so this is for position two. That induced flux is out, <coughs> out of the board, out of the screen. So what's the direction of the current? We have to use for step four, right hand rule number two, to de determine the direction of the current. We're going to put our thumb in the direction of the induced flux and the induced field, which are always in the same direction, which is out of the screen. And then our fingers are going to curl in the direction of the current. So the current here, we call that a counterclockwise direction. <coughs> Let's do this one. Down here. This is position four now. Tell me about the direction of the applied flux through this ring. Well, it's the same as the direction of the magnetic field through the ring. And what is that direction? It's in. So this is the, the applied flux is in, still in. Same as up here. It's because that magnetic field, the imposed applied magnetic field is in. But now what is it doing? Is it increasing or decreasing? Well, it's going from the ring being the magnetic fields fully penetrating this ring to the point where it's not penetrating at all. The area of overlap is actually decreasing with time instead of increasing over here. And so this flux is in but it's decreasing. Well, happy day, because we have this case covered. If the applied flux is decreasing with time, then the induced flux is in the same direction as the applied flux. It tries to keep it the same. So this implies that the induced flux is in the same direction. Well, it's in the same direction as the applied flux. And what's the direction of the applied flux? In. So the induced flux must also be in. If the induced flux is in, here. I know there's a lot of words and you, you get a lot of chances to, uh, to think about this in homework. If the induced flux is in, that means the induced magnetic field is in. And using right hand rule number two, I'm going to put my thumb in the direction of the induced magnetic field. And my fingers will curl in the direction of the current. So the current in this case <coughs> is clockwise. Current up here was counterclockwise. The current here was clockwise. Okay, this is an important slide for trying to, <coughs> excuse me, understand how this works. This is basically the same problem that we just did. A metal loop moves at constant speed. This is the loop, and this is the speed. It's moving to the right. Instead of coming in from the top, it's coming in from the left in this case. Moves through the magnetic field region. Uh, which one of the graphs shows the behavior of the current in the loop? Well, basically when it's entering the magnetic field region, we're going to get a counterclockwise current, just like we did here. So while it's entering here, we'll get a counterclockwise current. Before it enters the region, we get zero current. While it's entering the region, we get a counterclockwise current. While it's in the region, we get no current. And then while it's leaving the region, 
we get a clockwise current, and then after it's passed through the region, we get zero current. And so, if you think about the current being positive in the clockwise direction and negative in the counterclockwise direction, then we're going to be looking at one of these that will, that will mimic what we're talking about. We're going to need to have zero current, then negative current, then zero current, then positive current. So the only two that actually have those characteristics are this one. Here's zero current, negative current, zero current, positive current, and then zero current again. Uh, that one would work. This one would also work. Neither, none of these will, will do the job. We need a negative current, then a positive current. Well, which between these two, it will actually do the job the best? And the answer is, what matters as this, as this um, wire loop is passing into the region of the magnetic field is not how much magnetic flux is in it, but how that magnetic flux is changing with time. If this loop is, ring is um, square, whatever it is, uh, is moving at a constant velocity, then the rate of change of the area that overlaps with the loop will be the same all the way during that time that it's in the entering the magnetic field region. So it's this guy that correctly reflects that, that reality and this one. So that's the, the current is, is going to be constant during that whole time that it's entering the magnetic field region. Uh, one more example, a conducting loop is connected to a resistor. The resistor and the loop are at rest in a magnetic field that is directed toward you. So this is out, magnetic field that's out of the screen. The magnetic field decreases to half its initial value. While this field is decreasing, we want to know the direction of the current in the loop. All right, well, let's do it. Step one is to determine the direction of the applied flux. What's the direction of the applied flux through this loop? And you say, well, it's the direction of the applied field through the loop, which is out. And I say yes. Step two is determine whether this uh, applied flux is increasing or decreasing. Well, we're told that the magnetic field's magnitude is decreasing. So if that magnetic field is decreasing with time, then that magnetic flux must also be decreasing. All right, if the flux is decreasing, then back to this guy, if the applied flux is decreasing, then the induced flux is in the same direction as the applied flux. So this implies, step three, that the induced flux is in the same direction as the applied flux. And what direction is that? It's out. So if the induced flux is out, the induced field is out, we put our thumb in the direction of the induced field, which is out of the screen. Our fingers coil in the direction of the current. So that's a counterclockwise uh, current induced into the, into the loop.